title of this message tonight is Prayers, Prophecies, and Proclamations. Ministering under the priestly, prophetic, and kingly anointing. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the next few moments that you would anoint my tongue, that it would be as it were a pen of a ready writer, that would speak words of life, revelation, wisdom, counsel. I pray, oh God, that the ears of this people would be open to hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the church. Father, I pray for release of the spirit of wisdom, counsel, understanding, and knowledge, Lord, that it would go forth in the name of Jesus. And I pray, oh God, Lord, that you would receive all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen, amen and amen. At the beginning of this year, the Lord had given me a, a prophetic word. Uh, for the remnant church. This word wasn't for the world. It wasn't for the generic body of Christ. It was for the remnant church. And that word came out of Psalm 24, verse 3. It says, Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. He's not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing. Say with me, blessing. Blessing, blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob. The generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. You see, for the past seven years, God has called out his remnant church as the Jacob generation to ascend to the hill of the Lord, to seek his face in the secret place and be transformed from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've abided under the shadow of the Almighty. But in Psalm 24, and verse 7, he says, lift up your heads. O you gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. You see, God has brought us from a place of being the Jacob generation. He's calling the remnant church to be the Joshua generation. It's time to arise and shine, church. It's time to lift up our swords and go into battle, to begin to take the giants of the land, to lock up their heads, and begin to possess the kingdom of God for King Jesus. Amen. Yeah. The remnant church is not only entering into a season of blessing, but a season of glory and of war. So over the next seven years, God has called out this Joshua generation to move into that place of authority, of power, and possession. You know, we had a Super Bowl a few months ago, and uh, the Lord often speaks to me through the Super Bowl. No different this year. And in this particular, I said, Lord, are you speaking through the Super Bowl? He said, you look, look at the score. And I said, okay, look, Lord, it's, the score is 24 to 10. He says, well, look at Psalm 24, 10. And lo and behold, it was this passage of scripture out of Psalm 24. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Amen. 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 The Lord of hosts is translated Lord Sabaoth. Which means the Lord of armies. You see, God's raising up an army in this time and in this season. And as Joshua entered into Jericho, it said that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite with a strong sword in his hand. And I believe that God in this hour, he is raising up a people that will not stand idly by. But begin to raise their swords and begin to lop off the head of the enemy. To enter boldly into the promised land. To God's moved us from a Jacob season of waiting on God to a Joshua season of warring with God. Amen. He's moving us from a season of only abiding under the shadow of the Almighty into a season of presiding over the enemies of Canaan. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. A very famous passage of scripture that I want to look at very quickly tonight. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Say with me, stand. Amen. Against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take all the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. Say with me, withstand. Amen. In the Truth, putting on the breast 
breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of who? Yeah. The wicked one. If we look at this passage of scripture, we see that the army of God, or the armor of God, is predominantly used for defensive purposes. And in this passage, we find the word stand or withstand four times. However, I believe the body of Christ has been defensively postured for long enough. Yeah. Amen? Amen. We've got the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. But in order for the body of Christ to take ground in the promised land and preside over the enemies of Canaan, we need to use offensive weaponry. And the full armor of God has one offensive weapon. That's right. In verse 17 he says, And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So we know that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. It says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. But what word of God is he speaking of here? Is he speaking of the Logos, the written word of God, or is he speaking of the Rhema, the living spoken word of God? I believe that he's not speaking of either or. I think he's speaking both and. My Bible says in 2 Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second chapter, Peter chapter 1 verse 20. No prophecy of scripture is given by any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God, as they spoke, were moved by who? The Holy Spirit. You see, I believe that God has inspired not only the word of God, but he also has made our Mouths like a sharp sword. Isaiah 49, he gets made by mouth like a sharp sword. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. God's words are powerful. They are sharp. They are cutting. In Revelation it says that he had a right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. To the angel of the church of Pergamos, these things says he who is the sharp two-edged sword. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against him with the sword of my mouth. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. God has a sword, and it comes out of his mouth. But I believe that he's given his saints, as we are sons of the Most High God. Amen. Swords and, and the fire of God to come out of our mouth is a sword to cut asunder the enemies of God's glory in this time, in this season. Paul elaborates in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. He says, and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, pray. Always with all prayer and supplication. How? In the spirit. So if we look at this passage of scripture, we are to take the sword of the spirit by praying in the spirit. Amen. 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 Simply put, praying in the spirit is one of our offensive weapons against the enemy. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, it says, Likewise, the spirit knows our weaknesses, for we don't know how we should pray as we ought. But the spirit himself makes an intercession with us, which groanings. Which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit. Why? Because makes, he makes intercession for us according to the will of God. Yeah. You see, when we begin to pray in the spirit, we're not praying some selfish prayer. We're praying the very words of God. And out of our belly, flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. Prophesying, preaching, proclaiming the word of the Lord. Yeah. Amen. You see, we wield the sword of the Spirit by praying Holy Spirit-inspired words from God, also known as speaking in tongues. We're praying the perfect will of God when we speak in tongues. That's why the devil makes it a priority to downplay 
the importance of speaking in tongues. I, I read, read a statistic recently that 40% of Assembly of God members speak in tongues. Only 40%. Only 40%. No wonder we're in trouble, church. Yeah. Amen? Amen? That's the reason why the body of Christ is so weak. It said we're supposed to build up ourselves on the most holy faith by what? Praying yeah. in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I believe that God wants to resurrect that message. You know, I, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Back on June 29, 1986, 11 o'clock in the morning, at Bethel Temple on Sunday of God, in Hampton, Virginia, on Todd's Lane in Aberdeen. <laughs> the reason why I know all that, because it changed my life. I left there, they picked me off the floor. And they gave me a prophecy. And we came my life scripture. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert, in the desert, in the desert. A highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain hill brought low. The crooked way shall be made straight. And the rough places smooth. The glory, the glory, the glory. Shall be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. But the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That is a word from God. Not only for me, it's a word for this city, it's a word for this state. And God's raising up a company of prophets to prepare the way of the Lord in the city that we would be a bastion of His glory. Yeah. 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 God brought you into the city for such a time as this. You may not know why you're here, but I know why you're here. You're here to be as you are a carrier of the glory of God. So we have established that the word of God spoken out of our mouth is the sword of the spirit and serves as an offensive weapon against the enemy. However, to be in, in order to be effective in defeating the enemy, we must understand three things. Number one, the different expressions of the sword of the spirit. Number two, the purpose of these expressions. And number three, the anointing that accompanies these expressions. The first expression of the sword of the spirit is prayer. Say with me, prayer. Prayer, prayer. prayer is an appeal, a request, a plea, an entreaty. Who we are to pray to? Matthew 7, verse 1, he says, How you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts? to those who simply ask him. We just got to ask the Father. He's a good God. Amen. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights with whom there's no variables, no shadow of turning. We serve a good God. you got to believe in the goodness of God. Without it, you're going to think God's going to strike you. You know, every time there's an earthquake, every time there's a hurricane, it's always an act of God. My God's not a destroyer. Amen. And I don't have time to preach this, but there is a law called the law of sin and death. When you sin, you draw judgment. Amen? Amen. And our God grieves when he sees judgment in the land. He's a God of mercy and love and peace. Amen? Amen. So who do we pray? Do we pray for the Father? How do we pray? We pray in faith. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. That's a promise, church. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, we ask, who do we pray to? We pray to the Father. We pray to him in the name of Jesus. We pray to him in faith. And how, when do we pray? We pray always. What does it say in Ephesians 6, 18? Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Paul said, the Amplified Bible, he said, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you all put together. Amen. We got to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. I don't care what they say. All we got to to pray in tongues on video. It's going to go on video. We're praying in tongues. Amen. Get used to a church. Amen. We got to resurrect the importance of praying in the Spirit. Praying in tongues. Amen. They call me old fashioned, but I'll tell you what, the glory is not old fashioned. Healing's not old fashioned. Miracles aren't old fashioned. God's not old fashioned. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I lost my place. <laughs> what is the purpose of prayer? Prayer is a request for divine intervention to fulfill our need for heavenly purpose provision and power. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. He says, Paul said, I do not cease making mention of you in my prayer, that you would know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of his glory in the inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. We've got to believe that he's a good God. We've got to believe that he wants to provide us purpose, provision, and power. You see, prayer is the vehicle with which we receive our inheritance laid up in glory. Jesus paid a price for that inheritance and it's a shame that the trophy rooms of heaven, the warehouses of heaven are full. God wants to empty them. And yet we've got to receive them in faith. We've got to make a demand on heaven. God send your glory, send your healing, send your miracles, send your power. No more weak church. We got to make a demand on heaven. Now prayer comes under the priestly anointing. You see, prayer is a petition of a royal priesthood to a holy God. Second Chronicles chapter 30 verse 27. Then the priests, say with me priests, priests, the Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place to heaven. You see, when we pray, we ascend into heaven as priests, making our petitions. We come boldly under the throne of grace. And too many of us are coming with a heaping condemnation us because the devil's caught you in sin. But I tell you what, God wants to break off all condemnation. Amen. Amen. He wants to break off all guilt so you can come boldly. Because if you can't come boldly, guess what? You can't get the prize. you got to come boldly under the throne of grace. Then you will see grace and mercy in your time of need. Amen. That's one of the things I was talking to Pastor Mike on the phone today. That's one of the things that's held back people from receiving their miracle. Why? Because of condemnation. Because of the guilt of sin. You know what? We've got to get over our sin so we can do work for the king. The devil's got us so bound up in fear because we're so condemned we can do nothing for him. You can't come in faith if you're in sin. Amen? God wants to clean up the church. He wants to send his spirit of judgment and burning to purge and purify and cleanse our remnants. And we'll be able to rise and shine and do exploits for the king. First Peter chapter 2 verse 5. You also are living stones being built up as a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. First Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation his own special people that you would show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. We're a holy priesthood. And we operate under the priestly anointing when we pray. And that is what most Christians understand. That is what most Christians operate under is the priestly anointing. But guess what? There's two more anointings that we got to begin to move in if we're going to do exploits for God. The first one is prayer. The second one is prophecy and the prophetic anointing. Yeah. The expression of prophecy is the second expression of the sword of the Spirit. And prophecy is a declaration of divine purpose. It's very simple. We want to spiritualize and complicate things and act like we know so much theologically, but that's really all prophecy is. It is a declaration of divine purpose. However, a revelation of divine purpose precedes a declaration of divine purpose. That's why Paul continually prayed for the saints that they would receive the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of counsel. How many of you heard of the seven spirits of God? There's a little booklet I want to write about. It. I got a whole message on it. Maybe we'll hear it sometime. On the seven spirits of God, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, counsel, might, understanding, knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. And we need all of those act, aspects and attributes. But notice that four of the seven have to do with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel. Why? Because God wants you to know what is the hope of his calling. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul also prayed. He says, we also do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom 
and spiritual understanding. Notice, knowledge we declare his purposes. Amen. 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 It's not rocket science, but amen. You see, Christians can only be effective in manifesting and expanding his kingdom when the will of God is known. If we don't know what God's doing, how can we move into it? If we don't know what God's saying, how can we prophesy? Yeah. Amen? Right. Therefore, prayers for the outpouring and the reception of the spirit of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and counsel are necessary to catalyze the release of the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Amen. That's what we need to be praying for. We have, Lord, pour out your spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and knowledge. Because out of that, the spirit of prophecy will fall. And you begin to prophesy over your life, over your city, over your family, over your nation. Amen. And God wants to stir up the gift of prophecy in his saints. So what is the purpose of prophecy? The sword of the spirit is wielded. I swear out. The sword of the spirit is wielded when the spirit of prophecy is released upon the Lord's messengers. Revelation 19 verse 10. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yes. Yes. You see, the testimony of Jesus is not only recorded in the Bible. It is recorded in the books of heaven. Psalm 139 verse 16 says, In your book they all were written, the days that you had fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Meaning that before time began, God had a plan and a purpose for your life. And he wrote it in heaven, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. Amen? Amen. The spirit of prophecy in the mouth of God's messengers declares his will and purposes for individuals, families, states, and nations. Revelation 12, verse 11 says, And they overcame him who? The accuser of the brethren. They overcame the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the Lamb and by what? The word of their testimony. That's the will of God. And they did not allow their lives unto the death. You see, the testimony of Jesus, which is the word of God, when released through the spirit of prophecy, enlightens men to God's purposes. See, that's what prophecy is. It's declaring what the will of the Lord is for a person, for a church, for a city, for a nation. We need to know that. The Bible says, Paul, Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Well, how? You press toward the mark when the mark's never been set. You see, the spirit of prophecy sets the mark so we can press toward the mark for the prize. For there's a prize, church. Amen. We're not just here to take up space. We're here to reach our high calling. The high calling of God. Not the lower or the medium call, but the high call yeah, yeah. of God. Yeah. Amen? And so prophecy sets that mark. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of of knowledge. Right. You see, if you don't know what the will of God is, and you don't know the devil's plans, you're at a great disadvantage because you're walking around, maybe even with a sword, but you're blind and you're deaf. And you're fish bait. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the prophetic anointing. Prophecy is the revelation of not only prophets, but every saint. Now, in the Old Testament, it says, Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to the servants, his prophets. But in the New Testament, Acts 2, 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days. I believe the, these are the last days, folks. In the last days, that God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Say with me, all. All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. It doesn't say the prophets will prophesy. It says your sons and daughters. Are you a son? Are you a daughter? Well, if you're here on the earth, you're a son or you're a daughter. And you're going to prophesy. If you're in the will of God, you're going to prophesy. 1 Corinthians 14 and 31. For you can all prophesy. One by one that all may learn and they all may be encouraged. All in the Greek means, guess what? 
We're brothers and sisters. Martha liked to serve. Mary liked to sit. <laughs> and at one time, Lazarus got very sick. And they sent word to the Lord, your friend Lazarus is dying. Was very sick. And uh, and the Lord didn't go at that time. He didn't go. The sickness is going up to death. So what happened? Lazarus died. And so he came. He came. And Martha came out and said, Lord, if you only come sooner. And what did Jesus reply? If you will only believe, you will see the glory of God. Yes, yes. And with a loud voice, he cried, Lazarus, come forth. Yes. And he came forth. It wasn't a prayer. It wasn't a prophecy. It was a proclamation. <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. And I've heard somebody say this before, that if he did pre-curse that or or, or Say the name. Lazarus, the name Lazarus, and if he would have said, come forth, oh. they would have all kind of people coming out. <laughs> all kind of dead people coming out of those caves. <laughs> Amen? Nope. Not you, John. Not you, Matthew. Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> and of course, he came forth. Proclamations have resurrection power. Proclamations have healing power. There's a man standing at the gate, beautiful city there, not standing, sitting. Jesus passed him by many times. Never knew. Peter comes by after Jesus' resurrection. And the man looks up at Peter expecting to receive something from him. And what did Peter say? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise! also have judicial power. Paul was out ministering. I forget. I think he was with, maybe with Silas or one of those. And uh, he was been, had been jailed and he came before the proconsul. His name was Sergio, Ser, not Sergio, Sergius, <laughs> Sergius Paulus. Yeah. And he began to preach the gospel. To them. But there was a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet by the name of Bar Jesus. And he began to try to persuade the proconsul against the faith. Then Saul, who was named Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is key. Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at Bar Jesus and said, O oh, fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Now listen here. And now indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. He didn't pray. He didn't prophesy. He decreed a judgment from heaven on this man. The hand of the Lord is upon you shall be blind. And what did it say? And immediately a darkness fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. You see, proclamations have creative power, resurrection power, healing power, and judicial power. But the body of Christ has not known how to move out in the kingly anointing. To begin to proclaim, to decree, to make ease. For God. For it's one thing to know the purposes of God and to prophesy them. That's wonderful. But when the time and season has come for the proclamation, the body of Christ needs to begin to arise and take the anointing of the king and begin to proclaim and decree what God is doing for this time. For it will set in motion. It will catalyze the will of God for your family, for you, for your city, and for your nation. The kingly anointing. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. 
This is Jesus Christ, the ruler. Say with me, ruler. ruler. Over the kings of the earth. To him who has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. And to him be glory and dominion. Revelation 5, 9 says, You have redeemed us to God by your blood and have made us priests and kings to our God. And we, say we, we, we shall reign in the earth. See, we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And he says, as kings and priests, we shall reign with him. You see, the king of glory is no different than any other king. Because the glory of any king is dominion. And dominion is gained by being victorious in what? Battle. There's a battle going on. There's a battle that's being engaged from heaven. And it says in scripture over the next seven years, I believe prophetically that God is coming in all his glory as the king of glory, as the Lord of armies. He's coming with his sword held high and he's coming to begin to take dominion in the earth. But he needs a people. He needs an army. He needs a people to rise up in the spirit of God and take their place. He's leading his army into battle. And as we operate under the priestly, the prophetic, and the kingly anointing by yielding the wielding the sword of the spirit through our prayers, our prophecies, and our proclamations, we will reign with Christ Jesus in the earth and exercise dominion over the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Everyone stand. We get our worship team come. Hallelujah. We're going to do some business with the king tonight. Amen. we got to begin to change our language. you got to know when to pray. You need to know when to prophesy. You need to know when to proclaim. But we've all been caught up in praying. I have somebody to prophesy. They end up praying. Amen. You have somebody to proclaim and they end up prophesying. We've got to begin to move from prophecy into proclamation. Hallelujah. And I want to give two examples tonight. Two examples tonight of prof prophecies that have been given over in Arizona. And one of them is in that scripture that God had commissioned me to come here 25 years ago. Or 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Hallelujah. All right. And that scripture is out of Isaiah chapter 40. It says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed in all flesh. We'll see it together. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. That's a prophecy. Because it's telling of something, the future that is to come. But to change that prophecy into a proclamation, we got to remove one word. And that word is shall. So we need to be declared. Glory of God. from the courts of heaven and execute 
Egypt as kings the judge had written. Psalm 149 talks about it. Tonight. And I believe that God wants to release the kingly anointing tonight. Father, we just wait upon you. And in the name of Jesus, Father, as you commissioned me to preach this 